to understand our ancestors' taste for human flesh. This week's cannibal includes scenes which you may find disturbing. Eating is central to life and to culture. But the idea of eating a fellow human being is the ultimate taboo. The instinct to block it out is so strong that we choose to deny it could happen in a civilized society. In Britain, cannibalism does not even constitute a crime. Instead, tales of man-eaters are viewed as myth and exaggeration from the distant past, or the very rare acts of a psychopath. They're not part of today's sophisticated world. But the truth about cannibalism is being re-examined, and the scientists investigating it are revealing an uncomfortable story that lies deeply rooted in human behavior. We find it hard to grasp that eating people could be central to a human culture. It's the dark side of humanity. It clearly is part of our heritage that goes back to, to the distant past, and we haven't shed that heritage. It doesn't seem very strange to me. It's as explicable as anything else that humans do. Last year, beneath the murky waters of a lake used as a training ground by Britain's Olympic rowers, a set of human bones was found. Archaeologists concluded that they came from the early Iron Age, just 3,000 years ago. The bones, mostly legs, were brought to Professor Margaret Cox of Bournemouth University. Margaret and graduate student Irene O'Sullivan's first analysis has shown up some very peculiar features. We've got four femur and one tibia. This is one of the, the femur, and this is actually what it should look like. And as you can see, it's undergone quite significant modifications since it left a human being. The first modification was breaking. The bones had lost their end joints, and there was something potentially significant about how they'd been broken. If you look at the end of this bone here, for example, in order for a bone to break with a fracture pattern like that, you'd actually have to break it when it was very fresh. If bone gets broken when it's old, it breaks in a completely different way. But it's even more extensive than that because we've also got teeth mark on the shafts of all of the bones. And to add to the complexity of this story, we've also got areas of very fine cut marks which were made by a very, very sharp blade. Lovely. That's, that's brilliant, actually. Bones broken, bite marks, knife marks. But why? For Margaret Cox, faced by such evidence, the first and most obvious assumption was that there must be some connection to a funeral rite or burial. The ancient Britons are known to have been a highly spiritual people. 3,000 years ago, their lives were bound up with complex rituals, as was their treatment of the dead. In Bronze Age and Iron Age Europe, there is a shifting mosaic of different practices relating to the disposal of the dead, with the cremation or burial of the whole body, uh, dismemberment or the treasuring of particular body parts like skulls. What we do know about the Iron Age is that you get a mixture of things going on. You get cremation, you get some inhumation or burial, you get 
odd bones in ditches, you get bones in what were watery deposits, so you've got a whole range of funerary rites taking place. And this is one of the reasons these bones are so very important, is because they actually add possibly a new dimension to our understanding. There was one particular ritual of the ancient Britons, more likely than any other, to leave marks on bones. It was sky burial, a process in which the dead were left out on platforms in the open air. Sky burial is a process of dealing with the dead that involves actually exposing the bodies to allow them to be defleshed. If you expose bodies um, and they're unprotected, then animals will come in and they will dismember bodies, eat parts of them, but they will also take a lot away. To find out if sky burial caused the marks on the Eaton Lake bones, Margaret designed an intriguing piece of experimental archaeology. She recreated a sky burial with a dead organic pig. Margaret set up a surveillance camera to monitor what would happen. The pig contained no preservatives and no animal antibiotics, and just like Iron Age man, there was nothing to delay the natural forces of decay. The results were dramatic. The most impressive thing of all was the rate at which fly activity, and maggots in particular, went through the pig. I mean, they literally destroyed it within a matter of days, and all we had left was skin and bone. It's clear from our experiment that if people in the Iron Age actually wanted to produce skeletons from human remains for ritual processes, that to actually expose something on a platform would be a good way of skeletonizing somebody without actually damaging their bones. The experiment proved that sky burial was an efficient way to deflesh bones. And it could also have accounted for the animal gnaw marks on the Eaton Lake bones. But it could not explain two very important features, the smashing of the ends of the bones and the cut marks. A startling alternative was beginning to emerge. Might the Eaton Lake bones be the latest evidence in a human story that goes back nearly a million years? The people who lived here, at Grandalina Cave, 800,000 years ago, were early humans, or hominids, among the first of our European ancestors. They hunted deer and bison and brought them back to their caves where the animals were cut up and eaten raw. Six years ago, a collection of bones was found in the cave by a team of Spanish archaeologists. Most were animal, but some were human. They were analyzed by Yolanda fernandez Yalvo. In the Grandolina site, there were found six individuals. There are two children two adolescents and two uh, adults, and all of them, they have cut marks. Curiously, exactly the same sort of cut marks found on the bones of the animals at Grandolina were also found on the human bones. We found very clear the cut marks of this tiny clavicle of a child. It's excellent uh, preservation of the, of the fossils. This is another case of a cut mark showing a very characteristic shape of the cut marks. Something very sharp must have caused these cut marks on the animal and human bones. There's only one thing it could have been. John Lord makes flint tools and flint like this is the tool early humans all over Europe were using to cut the flesh off their prey a million years ago. There'll be some good cut marks appearing on the ribs now we've made contact with the rib cage. It's the nicks, cuts and scars left by ancient flint knives which are the telltale clues as to how animals, or perhaps humans, have been butchered. 
green bone there marks very very easily you can see it there now where we come into contact with bone like in this area here every time you hear that sort of scraping sound we're we're making little cut marks and uh, they would show up very very well some would be microscopic it's just these sort of marks which Yolanda found on the bones of the early humans at Grandolina. But there were other unusual cut marks. We have found other kind of cut marks that are indicating that once the bone has been dismembered and all the meat taken off, they are, they are cleaning the bone and preparing the bone probably to break it to extract the marrow. There is only one reason the Grandolina people would have wanted to extract the marrow. Even these very early humans would have discovered that this fatty marrow was a highly nutritious part of any animal. The fact that the human remains have been found mixed with the animals is actually indicating that they are the food remains of other people. The evidence is clear. The cannibalistic practice is actually nutritional. There is no evidence that the Grandolinans had any complex culture or funeral rites. These very early humans must have simply viewed each other as a good source of food. But did their habits stay embedded as modern humans emerged? The people who lived here at Cheddar 12,000 years ago were just like us. They may have lived in caves, but unlike the Grandolinans, they had a developed culture. People of this time are known to have painted on the walls of their caves and carved statues. And they also left behind some bones. Goff's cave at Cheddar has been developed as a show cave for over 100 years. So in that time, a number of human bones have been found but uh, it wasn't really until the 1920s that human material came up that we can date to around 12, 13,000 years ago. Then in 1986, we then started to investigate and dig properly, and we then found the jaw and then a whole assemblage of human bones. The bones turned out to be five people, two adults, two teenagers, and a young child aged about three. All showed cut marks we started to find human material where, as soon as we washed off the sediment, we could see cut marks on the bones. So we've got a pretty consistent pattern of, if you like, butchery or dismemberment. And this is picked up again on this skull. And here the cut marks are in several places, but in particular, there's a pattern of marks across this part of the skull. And the preservation of the cut marks is so good that we can even tell that a right-handed individual was cutting upwards with a flint tool to actually remove the flesh from the skull. So there was no doubt that this material had been processed by humans. Of course, it was still uncertain what lay behind that. That humans were butchered and processed is clear, but that in itself did not necessarily mean cannibalism. Like Margaret Cox with the Eaton Lake Bones, Chris Stringer's first assumption was of a connection with funeral rites. Archaeologists believe that even people of this time had their own forms of religion and of burial. Was some form of ritual responsible for the cut marks? Uh, we obviously considered the different options when this material was found, whether there might be ritual treatment of the human bones, ritual burial. There are burial practices today where human bones are broken up into small pieces. So, of course, it might have been that these bones were merely just being broken up into small pieces. And to do that, you needed to apply force to the bones. But there was one crucial piece of evidence suggesting that funeral rituals could not be the answer. This was the similarity in how both human and animal remains had been butchered. 
The animal bones showed patterns of breakage, presumably to extract marrow. And here are a couple of examples of human bones. For example, a human humerus uh, broken into small pieces, considerable force applied to these bones, apparently in the same way that the animal bones are being treated. And what's particularly interesting, if we take, for example, this uh, mandible here of a, a deer, we can see the cut marks here along the jawbone. And some of these marks have certainly been made to remove the tongue. When we look at some of the human material, and here's a, an adult jawbone, there are a series of vertical cut marks inside the jawbone, which again seem to have been applied to remove the tongue. If the human bones were butchered in exactly the same way as the animals, the argument for a ritual burial disappears. If we argue for that, we've then got to argue that these animal bones were being treated ritually and buried in the same way. So I think the human bones were being processed in the same way as the animal bones for food. At Bournemouth University, Margaret Cox was being drawn towards the same conclusion with the Eton Lake bones, but one that seemed extraordinary for ancient Britons of only 3,000 years ago. So extraordinary that she invited archaeologist Dr. Timothy Taylor of Bradford University for a second opinion. The evidence, although in a way it looks very slight when you see it under the microscope, tiny little striations along the bone, when I see that, it's very exciting because that shouldn't be on human bone. Um, it, it can't get on there accidentally. The clinching evidence came by making a comparison with the bones from Grandolina, where there's no doubt that cannibalism was the only possible explanation. Irene, what we've got here is um, some video images of, of bone from Grandolina in Spain, and it's amazing to see how similar our cut marks are to their cut marks. It's brilliant actually to see the two side by side because it's very reassuring because we're not used to seeing cut marks in human bone assemblages from the UK. So to see them from somewhere else is brilliant. I think the Eaton Lake bones are what we've been waiting for. It looks like a cannibalism signature and That's it tough. is consistent with removing meat in a very careful way. There's scuff marks, they've taken everything that would be useful and good for eating. We obviously can't photograph ancient Britons eating human flesh, so this is archaeologically probably the closest we'll get. We clearly have this cannibalism going on, but of course the fossil record is only a tiny sample of the people that lived in the past. If we're picking up butchery and cannibalism in this very sparse sample of humans and human behaviour from the past, then indeed it cannot have been a rare event, one has to say that. The weight of evidence shows that cannibalism was widely practised by ancient man. So one question follows. Why were our ancestors eating each other? Was it just for nutrition? Or was it something more sinister? The time. The Eaton Lake bones came from Britons living just 3,000 years ago. It's clear they were not eating each other out of pure hunger, as they had not split the bones to get at the nutritious fatty marrow. So why were they doing it? Was it a quick snack? Was it part of some highly ritualised cannibalism where feasting from the dead was a part of something much bigger and much more complex? Was it a mark of enormous respect or was it something that was utterly disrespectful? Possibly we're looking at something that wasn't about food, about needing the food supply from these bones. Possibly it was about something else, something much more stark. There is one clue as to what that stark reason might be. The Eaton Lake bones are a very rare find. Precisely what happened after death to the Iron Age British has become one of archaeology's greatest mysteries. 
the riddle of the British Iron Age is that the dead appear to have vanished. There was a large population, warlike tribes that the Romans had a lot of trouble subduing, and yet archaeologically we have something like 0.01% of the bones that we ought to have. We just don't know where the bones have gone. So what happened to the dead? The ancient Britons were aggressive, warlike tribes. We know there were head cults and the collecting of skulls. Could warfare have been the trigger for cannibalism amongst the ancient Britons? And could this be at least part of the answer as to why so many of the Iron Age dead disappeared? It's a tantalising question, and the evidence is elusive. But can anything more concrete about motive be gleaned from the bones at Cheddar Cave? There, a group of families lived together. Why were at least six members of that group cannibalised? We don't, of course, know whether they were eating members of their own group because they had died naturally. That's certainly a possibility. You know, one can argue that these individuals were killed on the spot in the cave by another group that came into their cave, killed them and ate them. Alternatively, you could argue that the bodies were brought into the cave from somewhere else and butchered. One of the individuals does seem to have been beheaded. There are cut marks on, on vertebrae, in neck vertebrae, that indicate that an individual was beheaded, probably when they were lying face down. But again, we don't know how much violence was involved in their deaths. Cheddar hints at an act of violence. But real evidence for aggression as a primary motive for cannibalism amongst our European ancestors comes from a unique discovery in 1986. Fifteen years ago, in a cave called Fombrigua, the damaged remains of six humans were discovered. They were found to have lived 7,000 years ago and, like the Cheddar people, were hunter-gatherers living in small groups in caves. The original analysis of the Fombrigua bones was carried out by Dr. Paola Villa. At Fombrigua, we found three concentrations of human bones. And not only they had cut marks, the bones were broken with a stone hammer to extract marrow. And that's the kind of behavior that you see normally all throughout the Stone Age for uh, treating animals. So I realized that we had a case of cannibalism. The bones came from two children, one adolescent and two young and one older adult. Painstaking examination revealed their skulls, like those at Cheddar, had clear signs of butchery. All of the cranial remains at Fombregua have cut marks that go from the forehead, like here, down all along the skull, down to the back, to the occipital bone. This is a way of opening the skin of the head and then you can pull it down. It's a, it's a way of skinning, which we also find on animals. So why were these people eaten? Like Grandolina and Cheddar, there could be several explanations. But unlike any other site so far, Fombrigua did offer one big clue to motive. All the cut-up human remains were discarded together in one very small pit. Paola concluded from this that they were all the victims of a single incident. The people that were cannibalized, it might have been a family or an extended family. And so I think this is, uh, is quite interesting because often when archaeologists excavate uh, human remains, they do not know the relations of one bone to the other. But in this case, we were able to say six or seven individuals were butchered all at the same time. If this was a single incident, it pointed to a single violent attack and enabled Paola to discount funerary rituals. But there was still one other possible motive, that this group had been eaten because others were starving. 
this I think is equally implausible. These are people who had agriculture. These are people who had domestic animals. These are people who were hunting. These are people who were moving around the landscape very easily. Generally, when people are starving, they go to another location. So I think that the plausible explanation is that there is some form of aggressive cannibalism tied to conflicts. It seems that one violent attack killed these people, and afterwards the attackers ate their victims. Fombrigua contained the first clear sign that, in some important way, aggression and warfare were inextricably linked to cannibalism. Just a thousand years ago, in part of the American Southwest, it seems that what happened in the cave at Fombrigua was happening on a far wider scale and with a new culinary twist. This is the land of the Fremont people. They were the dominant clan of the Great Basin in what is today the North American state of Utah. The Fremont hunted and farmed the land. They lived in pit house dwellings in small villages but their religion, rituals and warfare remain a mystery. We know very little behaviorally about belief systems of the Fremont. Um, they have very simple items, very simple uh, ceramics. They have some unique uh, figurines that suggest something symbolic that we can't quite interpret. There's also indications of, of scalps and head hunting, and certainly the rock art suggests some kind of symbolism we haven't quite figured out. 20 years ago, archaeology first threw up a strange story about the Fremont, which in recent years, Dr. Shannon Novak has been re-examining. It centers on a smashed set of bones from Backhoe Village, which came from two children, two women, and four males and the way their bones were found just doesn't fit in with how the Fremont normally treated their dead. Piles of bones were found on the floor, which was unusual for the Fremont because they did bury their dead. So they didn't deflesh bodies. There's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of cremating bodies. And so I got back into the collections and recognized that there was something very unusual about these bodies. What intrigued Shannon was something new in the archaeological record. Exfoliation, the flaking of the bone caused by heat. Almost all the individuals, as we started to reconstruct the heads, uh, exhibited this kind of unique roughened exfoliation on the tops of the heads. As we started looking closely at this exfoliation, you can see this gray looping pattern, which is described as smoking. And when looking closer using a microscope, uh, you see very fine, small cut marks. Also interesting was some of the trauma to the head um, that also occurred before the head was subject to heating. Um, this young juvenile has a very large blunt blow to the left side of the head. What must have happened was that these Fremont people were brutally killed, heated up, and then smashed to smithereens. But could the heating be part of a burial practice, or were the victims being cooked? Certainly it's not the kind of heat a body would be exposed to with cremation, um, where you get a, a blackening and then a blue. And this is more of a, uh, a lower temperature where you still have uh, flesh on a good part of the body and more of a roasting low heat. All the evidence pointed to a violent attack followed by a cannibal feast. In trying to weed out the other hypotheses, cannibalism seems to be the only one that sticks. It's what we see 
with very violent forms of warfare and intimidation. And that's what we're seeing in the archaeological record. Evidence is coming in from all around the world, from almost every prehistoric period, showing that cannibalism was going on. It's not universal, but there's a regular and specific signature from a wide variety of diverse and unrelated sites. But widespread cannibalism, most probably caused by acts of aggression or warfare, did not end in the realm of fossils. It's been going on ever since. And in more recent times, a combination of bones and eyewitness accounts has made it possible to build up a picture of a full-scale and terrifying cannibal society. Part of Cannibal, which contains scenes from the recent and brutal civil war in Liberia, which you may find disturbing. We find it hard to grasp that eating people could be central to a human culture and culture provides a whole system for thinking about the world and therefore it's entirely to be expected that cannibalism can become either much more prevalent or completely vanish. In the pagan ritual world of the European Iron Age, we can only guess at the meaning behind the cannibalism of the Eden Lake Bones. But what we do know is that as a new religion spread across Europe, cannibalism disappeared and the roots of a taboo took hold. The Western taboo against cannibalism is inseparable from the history of Christianity. The substitution of blood sacrifice with the sacrifice of Christ through the Eucharist, that the only form of human flesh and blood we ingest is the symbolic flesh and blood of Christ. And that makes other forms of human flesh eating anathema. In the late 18th century, European explorers of the Age of Enlightenment carried with them these Christian values and outlook. They had no archaeological finds to remind them that cannibalism existed in their own European ancestors. So in 1773, when Captain James Cook and others like him made contact with the noble savages of distant lands, they were in for a profound shock. When Captain Cook landed on Tonga, his Western notion of humanity, which had consigned the idea of cannibalism to the remotest classical myths and legends, was brought sharply up against a different type of reality. He says that the Tongans say of the Fijians that they're cannibals, and he says, we thought this was a misrepresentation, until he finds a Fijian who says, yes, this, this is what we do, and he later witnesses acts of cannibalism. What Cook stumbled on in the South Pacific was a society where cannibalism had for thousands of years been a way of life and death. Fergus Clooney is visiting the sacred site of Navatu. He was born on the Fijian Islands and is a former director of the Fiji National Museum. Navatu was once host to rituals of cannibalism, which, as Captain Cook discovered, were totally accepted by the local people. Nobody objected to the idea at all. They just were quite happily admitted to it, um, with no sense of, of shame or guilt. Um, that shocked Cook and, um, and his officers because they very much believed at that time that these were children of nature and that they were inherently noble and a thing like cannibalism simply couldn't exist. It was, a, it was an absurd idea. If Cook was astonished to find cannibalism, the natives were equally astonished that Cook was not a cannibal. 
Cook's journals recorded the stories of Fijian cannibalism, but most Europeans found them hard to believe. Yet in Fiji, cannibalism continued right up until 130 years ago, and in 1946, archaeology provided the final proof. Animal and human bones from the Nuvatu site were excavated by the American archaeologist Edward Gifford. Using the latest technology, David Degusta has been re-examining the bones Gifford found. When I looked at the bones, I saw much the same things that Gifford did, except in a little bit more detail. On the pig remains, we find burning and cut marks, as well as on the turtles and the fish and the other animals. We also find the same things on the human remains at about the same frequency. They're also cut marked, burned, and broken in about the same manner. So what we can infer from that then is that the bones were cooked, uh, the meat was sliced off, and the bones were broken up and then discarded. Gifford came to the conclusion of cannibalism by eyeballing it. He saw the, that the bones were burnt and broken and mixed in with non-human bones. So he concluded in kind of a famous quote that outside of fish, man was the most popular of the vertebrate animals used for food. So precisely why was cannibalism so deep-rooted in Fiji? The answer lies in their gods. At the time of Cook's travels, Fiji was a violent society, a melting pot of different clans constantly at war with each other. Every clan had its own ancestral gods, and every chief was a descendant of those gods. When war broke out, it was usually the result of age-old rivalries rekindled by the smallest insult. The clans believed their ancestral gods demanded revenge, and today that oral history has been passed down to the great-grandchildren of those chiefs. It's a driving force. It propels you forward to do as much damage to your perceived enemies. And at the same time, destroy this physical being and subject it to, uh, you know, unspeakable horrors and insult so as to placate your ancestral gods. The centerpiece of these horrors was cannibalism. The accounts of travellers and missionaries who came to Fiji after Captain Cook provide the raw material through which anthropologists have been able to unravel the complex spiritual meaning behind these cannibal rituals. The Fijian idea of what you might want to call spiritual power was very different from our own. It's a manifestation of power of the gods of that land. And people themselves were considered to be the substance of the land. Nalewini Vanua. It means the substance or the flesh of the land. And it was to be fed the flesh of their enemies that the clans believed their war gods wanted above all. There were intense battles fought for the specific purpose of capturing prisoners who would satisfy the gods' appetites. These prisoners were called bakolas, and became the focus of a cannibalistic ceremony which would lead to the final spiritual annihilation of the enemy. Once they get the bokola, the dead men, and then they carry the bokola back to the village, the men perform their vimbi, their war dance, to show their joy over the victory that they have achieved. And once they've reached the village, they take the Mbokola right to the temple. The body of the Pakola was now presented to the chiefs and then butchered and cooked in special ovens. Now came the climax of the ceremony. The priest, possessed by the spirit of the war god, 
was fed to the consecrated flesh of the Bacola. Nobody could touch it, and it was vital it did not touch the exterior of the priest's body, so it was usually a piece of meat which was fed on the end of a long fork that was put right into the priest's mouth, and it was then taken by the god within the priest and swallowed, consumed, and the soul of the person who had been killed, of the Bacola, was thus fed to the god and destroyed. When you put them in the oven, you imagine that your ancestral gods is also with you to participate in the ritual of eating of the flesh, which becomes therefore the high point of your existence and justification to your tribes about your leadership. When you read the accounts, they are always filled with this really heightened emotionality, which makes sense, because it was, a, it was an extreme act, and there is no doubt that they knew it was an extreme, it was an act of power. In the eyes of the clan, consuming the flesh of an enemy served a vital purpose. It prevented his soul from moving on to the spirit world, where, though dead, he would still have been able to help his people. It actually looks like an act of annihilation, that what you did when you ate someone was you wiped them out. So not only were the warriors eager to obtain victims that they would take back, and then sacrifice, but they were also very eager to take home the bodies of their own dead. And of course you can see why, because they don't want the bodies of their own dead eaten. Above all, a clan would do anything it could to prevent its chief being captured. If he was eaten, and therefore prevented from going to the spirit world, that would be the greatest disaster of all. Once a chief is held captive, I mean, the, the people who is under the chief is, uh, have really lost hope and uh, they are really downhearted. Yeah, they are really uh, broken. Mm. After the priest had eaten from the flesh of the Bacola, the rest was shared between the whole clan. With the Pakola's spirit destroyed, anything that remained of his body had no spiritual value and could be used as trophies or objects of intimidation. In some parts of this island, particularly up in the mountains, um, bones, skulls, jaws, ribs, um, long bones were kept as a register of Bacola. Um, in those cases, they were put between forked branches of particular trees in sacred groves attached to spirit houses and the wood grew around them so you had this register of bones in the trees. Elsewhere on the coast the shin bones they were made into sail needles sometimes into thatching needles. They all follow this general theme which is using the um, remains of the of the bukola, of the victim as a trophy basically and of course highly offensive to enemy clans. We have archaeological signatures for cannibalism now extending over about a million years. And in Fiji, we come right up to date and the archaeological material collides with the ethnographic record so that we can begin to get a handle on how embedded cannibalistic practice was in custom, in religious belief, what cannibalism in one place and time really meant for the people doing it. I think it would be not far from the truth to say that we are the product of some form of cannibalism, you know what I mean? Although I must confess, thankfully, that the urge is not here. <laughs> This link between warfare and cannibalism 
is still present in the world of today. In the recent civil war in Liberia, rebel soldiers displayed body parts of their enemies and talked of how they ate them. Within the last 10 years especially, we've seen how extreme violence against men and women, children, to the levels of actual cannibalism, if not just threats of cannibalism, um, can occur literally worldwide and in our back door. There's nothing that says we won't behave in that way. And unfortunately, from even from the most recent human history, from the atrocities we hear about in, in recent times, clearly um, humans can behave in, in very barbaric ways, even in supposedly civilized societies. Acts of aggressive cannibalism in the modern world are shocking. But in the light of the unfolding story of cannibalism, not perhaps so difficult to comprehend. So might Fiji, Liberia even, help to explain the cannibal mysteries left by the bones of the past? Could cheddar have been not about eating for nutrition, but about eating your enemy? Fonbrigua certainly was. And the Eaton Lake bones come from the Iron Age, a time of constant warfare between the violent tribes of ancient Britain. Could eating your enemies have been as symbolically important to the ancient Britons as it was to the clans of Fiji? Motive is always the most elusive thing of all to prove, but the scientific investigation shows one thing beyond doubt. Cannibalism is far more deeply rooted in the human story than most of us would like to believe. Those of us that work with human skeletal remains, um, this pattern's starting to become so prominent in the osteological, archaeological record that the processing pattern in itself isn't that interesting anymore. It's the big issues of what does this mean? I think in the last few years we've just seen such a lot of evidence from so many different places that cannibalism has been occurring in, in, in recent humans. Uh, it's been occurring right through the history of modern humans. So it does seem to be something that's been part of the human story probably for over a million years. If one wants to actually understand acts like these that we think are so extreme, it's actually a lot easier than you think. You just have to do the work of finding out. You need to know about their ideas of God or gods. You need to know about their ideas of power. You need to know about their ideas of what a person is. And once you know those things, you find how very human these, these things are. Actually very human. So it doesn't seem very strange to me. It's as explicable as anything else that humans do. Channel 4 book to accompany this series, Cannibal, The History of the People Eaters, is available now, price $14.99, and you can order your copy directly from the Channel 4 shop with free delivery on 0870 or click on to channel4.com forward slash shop.